Sometimes it's a fun challenge to pick up a broken vintage computer and spend the time and effort getting it fully restored. But this time, well, this time it simply wasn't worth it. At first glance, this Macintosh PowerBook 150 appeared to have a pretty typical problem, broken plastics around one of the screen hinges. I've seen this several times before, and fixing it is usually pretty straightforward. I delicately opened the lid to prevent further damage, and found that the pressure from the screen had caused the keyboard to get bent, so that's something else to add to the list of things to fix. A pair of torque screws hold the bezel on. The screw cover was missing on the right side, but was easy enough to pry out on the left. Then I carefully popped the bezel free since it's clipped to the rear display cover, and we already know the plastics on this thing have gotten brittle with age. If I'm lucky, there won't be any further damage. I had to remove the LCD panel in order to free the rear housing. It's secured with four torque screws around its perimeter. Conveniently, almost all the fasteners in this machine use a T8 screwdriver. I flipped the LCD onto the keyboard and the housing came right off. The threaded inserts for the right hinge are toast. The plastic around them crumbled so the metal hinge has nothing to secure to and can cause the housing to pry apart. This can often also cause the screw hole in the bezel to break and that's happened here too. There isn't any damage to the left side, but it's just as likely to have failed. Let's check out the rest of the machine for problems. I pried out the battery, which is likely dead, and found that it's beginning to swell in one corner. I plugged in the power book and held up the screen to find out if it would boot, but I couldn't see anything on the display. The brightness control worked, but the contrast slider did nothing. This felt to me like a problem with the LCD, so I got its cables disconnected. These panels have a series of capacitors on their control boards, and being over 30 years old, they've likely failed. They're in an interesting package. These are electrolytic caps mounted on their sides inside rectangular plastic casings. I didn't see any obvious signs of leakage, but that doesn't always happen when a cap fails, so the best course of action is to replace them all anyway. To reduce my chances of melting it, I decided to remove the plastic frame. This just involved bending back some metal tabs, then I could lift it away. It was simple enough to desolder the old caps under the microscope, and while doing so, I did get a couple whiffs of the fishy smell that indicates they've started leaking, so this work was definitely warranted. These kind of parts aren't being made anymore, so the next best option are tantalum caps which have to be tiny in order to span the solder pads. After cleaning those pads, I somehow managed to pull off getting the new caps installed. I was feeling pretty good about the repair. The work certainly wasn't perfect, but there weren't any shorts. I was reasonably confident the LCD would work again. But while I had my soldering tools out, I decided to disassemble the rest of the PowerBook to see if any other rework needed to be done. The 100 series machines are pretty serviceable, with just four screws on the bottom and one on the back by the optional modem port. This one usually has cracked plastic around it, so I wasn't surprised. Then the top half lifts up, and you can carefully reach in and release the single ribbon cable, connecting it to the bottom. I was happy with what I saw. The motherboard shouldn't need any work since it came with tantalum capacitors from the factory, which don't leak like electrolytic ones but I flipped over the top case and saw that the clock or PRAM battery had started leaking. It's mounted to this interconnect board that the display, keyboard, and trackball also attach to, and it's labeled JEDI, which was the PowerBook 150's internal codename at Apple. Those ribbon cables needed to be disconnected so I could get the board out for a closer look. A pair of screws hold in the display inverter board, which plugs into the interconnect, and then the interconnect itself can be unscrewed and carefully pried free, since there's an adhesive gasket around the speaker. With it out, we can see the extent of the leakage. It's actually not too bad and should be possible to clean up. I got the battery clipped out and the interconnect board didn't look too horrible either. 
There seemed to be some mild corrosion, but as far as I could tell, it was only on the traces for the speaker, which probably explains why I didn't get a chime when the machine powered on. So I temporarily plugged everything back in to see if the LCD was working again. But like before, nothing on screen, and only the brightness control worked. The hard drive was making some sad sounds, and I thought it might be interfering with the computer booting, so I disconnected it. But nope, no difference. I noticed there was an electrolytic cap on the inverter board, which also controls the display contrast. It was probably worth replacing, so I pried it up with a spudger so I could read its values, and then this happened. Ah, shit. Some glue applied at the factory to hold the cap to the board had also gotten on this coil, so when the cap came free, it took one leg of the coil with it. There wasn't enough left sticking out for me to solder to, and there weren't any markings on it, so I could order a replacement. I got the mad scientist idea of undoing just one winding of the coil. This wouldn't affect its value appreciably, but while soldering it back in, I failed to remember the connector right next to it, and ended up melting it. Finding replacement parts for this power book is a challenge. Any places that bother to list them are usually out of stock, and entire computers sold for parts are often unjustifiably expensive. Thankfully, my friend Jake was able to hook me up with another machine. Well, at least part of one. But it had what I needed, so I got it torn down. Its interconnect board looked to be in much better shape. The inverter board I needed was there too, so I got them both removed for closer inspection. The battery had only just started to leak, which meant the traces were still clean, and I got it snipped out right away. I quickly hooked it up to my original motherboard and screen, plugged in the power, and the display came to life. The power book was clearly trying to boot, which was a very good sign. That meant it was time to deal with the broken plastics. In addition to the right hinge and screw hole in the display bezel, there was also a standoff for the LCD that had gotten snapped off. I was able to 3D print replacements for all of these, and I'll include the link in the video description. Installing these parts involves snipping away the broken plastic, then sanding the area smooth. I used a piece of sandpaper in a clothespin to save my fingers and act as a sanding block. It's tedious work, but the flatter the surface, the better the results. Only the right hinge standoffs had broken, but the left side is just as likely to fail, so I decided to replace those as well. It's important to keep these brass inserts, as they get reused with the new brackets. I cleaned the area, then prepared to glue the new parts into place. I've had good luck with superglue meant for plastics. It includes an accelerator, which just wipes on, then I use tweezers to hold the part while applying the glue. Proper alignment is very important, but even with the accelerator, you still get a few seconds to adjust things before the glue takes hold. The left bracket is different from the right in that it has a channel for the display ribbon cable in the middle. Otherwise, it gets glued in the same way. I also took care of the broken LCD standoff, along with the screw hole in the front bezel. Then I used my soldering iron to heat stake the brass inserts into the new brackets. A normal tip works fine for this, but fellow YouTuber Stefan from CNC Kitchen came up with dedicated tips just for this task. These are a great idea. While the glue finished setting up, I turned to reassembling the top case. I decided to use the one from the parts machine since it was cleaner, in better shape, and had a keyboard without a big dent in it. I had to remove the remains of a broken screen standoff with pliers and a screwdriver, but the hinges themselves looked good. One of the hinge covers was missing, but it was simple enough to pop one off the other top case and gingerly snap it into place. Time to get the display back together. I got the rear housing screwed into the hinges, being careful to route the display ribbon and backlight cables through the cutouts in the new brackets. Then I could reconnect the panel and flip it up, but not before remembering to reinstall the shielding, which goes between the housing and the hinge. The LCD got screwed in next, and my replacement standoff in the corner seemed to be holding strong. The bezel is a little fiddly to align and clip in properly, but once that was done, I could put in the last two screws, being careful to not over-tighten them. 
The new top case came without a trackball, so I transferred it over. Then came the question of what to do about the hard drive. In an effort to cut costs, Apple had gone with an IDE drive in the PowerBook 150 instead of the usual SCSI. This is a 120 megabyte unit from Quantum, and with the noises it was making earlier, it's on its way out. Annoyingly, the ribbon cable covers one of the screws that secures it, so you have to pry it from its adhesive on the floppy drive and flip it up. But you also can't unplug the drive side of the cable without removing the drive first, because another one of the screw posts blocks it. Whatever, I got the drive out and the cable detached. I removed the mounting tray so I could transfer it over to this, another 3D printed bracket holding a compact flash to IDE adapter. A 4GB card is a bit excessive for this machine, but should be just fine. And I've done similar swaps in other PowerBook models before with good results. While I was here, I also fixed a little problem with the floppy drive. Its door had gotten out of alignment and just needed its hinge sorted. Finally, it was time to finish reassembly. The top case hinged into place while I fished around to connect the main ribbon cable, then I got the screws put back in with extra care taken to keep the plastics around the modem port from getting any worse. I plugged the machine in to confirm everything was connected properly, and while the screen still worked, I realized that the mouse pointer wasn't moving. Okay, maybe there's something wrong with the trackball assembly, so I took the PowerBook apart again and swapped over the unit from the original top case. It's just two screws and a ribbon cable, but after getting the machine together, it still didn't work. Back in again to take a closer look. The ribbon cable for the trackball is part of the keyboard, so I needed to try replacing that next. It's a bummer because this keyboard is in way better cosmetic shape than the original, but functionality is more important, for reasons we'll get into later. I was able to flatten out the bends in the keyboard sufficiently and get it installed, and that was thankfully enough to fix it. The trackball was working now. I took the opportunity to peel the labels off the PowerBook's lid, then dealt with the battery. I didn't want to put it back in, but I also didn't want to leave the compartment open. I wanted the machine to look cosmetically complete. With some gentle prying, it's possible to remove the cover from the pack itself, and then snap it onto the laptop. It's a bummer this was a design feature that Apple's later computers dropped. To get an OS installed on this thing, I turned, like I usually do, to my external blue SCSI. But it has a 25-pin connector, while the PowerBook used a square port known as HDI30. One of these adapters is super handy to have, especially since it can also handle SCSI disk mode. That doesn't really matter here, as in another bit of Apple cost-cutting, the PowerBook 150 doesn't support that feature. But no worries, the blue SCSI is bootable, so after plugging it in and turning the laptop on, it didn't want to boot from it. The blue SCSI has a pair of indicator LEDs for power and activity, but they were both dark. Oh yeah, that's right, for even more cost-cutting, Apple removed SCSI termination power from the 150, so I had to take the blue SCSI out of its case so I could plug in a micro USB cable and power it externally. That got it to wake up, but the PowerBook still wouldn't boot from it. There was no drive activity. Apparently, the SCSI adapter itself also needs termination power in order to work, so I had to replace it with this stupid big cable instead. Finally, the blue SCSI was working. I needed to format the compact flash card, so I turned to the usual tool for doing this, drive setup. But after thinking for a bit, it didn't detect the drive only the blue SCSI. Apple had gotten away from custom firmware when it switched to IDE drives, but I tried a patched version of drive setup anyway, and it didn't pick it up either. After digging for a bit, I found a document that explained what was going on. The PowerBook 150 has an IDE controller unlike those in other models. Again, likely because it was cheaper, so you have to use a different formatting program called Internal HD Format. It's the only machine that requires that program. The others can also use drive setup. So, fine. I launched it, and it didn't find the CF card either. What was going on? Vintage Macs don't really care about the whole fixed versus removable device thing when it comes to compact flash cards, but I tried swapping in a different one set for fixed mode anyway. 
That was a waste of time as the format utility still didn't pick it up. After a lot more research, I uncovered the reason why, and it's very dumb. Long story short, the PowerBook 150's IDE controller won't see any compact flash card as a usable device. It's possible to modify one of those CF card adapters to work around this, but it involves custom circuit boards and other shenanigans that, frankly, just aren't worth it. Problem is, I've had a lot of laptop IDE drives die on me lately, so there was only one left in my stash. This 30 gigabyte model from Hitachi. I wasn't sure it would work and none of the screw holes in the drive tray lined up, but I was losing patience with this project and just wanted to wrap it up. Once the machine booted, I was greeted with what looked like a good sign. It offered to format the drive to its full size. I went in to type a name, but found that the T key on the keyboard didn't work, because of course it didn't. Fine, the drive got formatted and I went to install system 7.1. It seemed to be working, but then threw an error about problems with the disk. Sorry, I'll teach you to be sorry, you... <sighs> Breathe. Okay, this one's because System 7 can't recognize a volume this big. Depending on the version you're running, you're limited to either 2 or 4 gigabytes. A workaround is to partition the drive into smaller volumes, but yeah, the only formatting tool that works on this laptop doesn't offer that feature. To say the PowerBook 150 is an underwhelming computer is a bit of an understatement. It's frankly a piece of shit, not just now, but when it was new. At its launch in July 1994, it was meant to be an affordable option in Apple's laptop lineup, and its price point of about $1,400 US was pretty compelling. Problem is, to hit that price, too many corners had to be cut. Its 9.5 inch LCD offered a resolution of 640 by 480, but it was a passive matrix panel with the typical ghosting and only displayed four shades of gray. It was slow, too. Apple was moving to adopt the new PowerPC processor across its lineup and had been putting Motorola's slower but still respectable 68040 CPUs in computers for several years. But it went with a 33 MHz 68030 chip from the late 80s instead, which made the 150 the last computer the company would ship with that processor. Normally, booting from a blue SCSI takes only a few seconds on other models, but on this one, it's no faster than the original mechanical drive probably was. While Apple had moved on when it came to its industrial design, the 150 continued using the same form factor as the other 100 series models, which had been introduced three years prior. Compared to the PowerBook 500 series that had launched just a couple months earlier in May of 94, the 150 looked dated right off the bat. While working inside the machine, I noticed a number of components with stickers that referenced Acer part numbers. That's because Apple had contracted with Acer to build the 150, which was cheaper than if Apple had done it themselves. The machine came with 4 megabytes of RAM on board and could be expanded to a total of 36, using the same kind of modules as seen in Apple's PowerBook Duo line. And that's because the 150's motherboard was based on the Duo's architecture, again, to save money. But this also led to other bizarre design limitations, such as the port selection. Other than the power input, the only other connections on the machine are for the optional modem, SCSI, and a single serial port. There's no way to connect a monitor, speakers, or, get this, even an external keyboard or mouse. If you didn't like what the computer had built in, tough luck. And that's why I had to get the trackball working. Some people did come up with creative solutions to a couple of these limitations. A company called Sigma 7 Systems offered its PB serial adapter, which plugged into where the modem went and offered a second serial port. It's also possible to hack in an ADB port for a keyboard and mouse, but you have to solder wires to the main interconnect interface on the motherboard and find somewhere on the case to install the connector. With all this in mind, the PowerBook 150 gives off similar vibes to another maligned Apple laptop, the 12-inch MacBook from 2015. 
That computer is infamous for its poor performance, horrible reliability with its so-called butterfly keyboard, and the fact it only included a single USB-C port. But as far as I'm concerned, the 150 is worse, if for no other reason than the fact you can at least use an external monitor, keyboard, and mouse with the MacBook if you wanted. The ravages of time have, of course, presented their own problems, what with failing capacitors and brittle plastics. Having to do so much restoration work for such a subpar computer just adds insult to injury. For a select few committed collectors, having a PowerBook 150 could be a worthwhile goal. But for anyone else just looking to pick up a vintage Mac laptop to have fun with, well, pretty much any other model is a better choice. If you liked watching me suffer, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. Here's another video you should check out. And as always, thanks for watching.